we're going to start with the tools that we're going to use for um, for this alignment. Um, we have some feeler gauges here. Uh, these are going to be used for looking for thickness uh, gaps, the thickness of gaps underneath the feet, as well as um, potentially any uh, uh, soft foot. And we're going to also potentially sometimes you can look for um, and measure the gap between couplings with these. Um, so just feeler, regular standard feeler gauges. Uh, we have a torque wrench. When you tighten up the bolts doing an alignment, every single bolt that you tighten back down um, has to be done with a torque wrench so that we know that um, if by some chance there is some flex in the in the base or there is is something changing we're, we're putting it down exactly in the same spot got a uh, six inch scale here um, so that's going to be used uh, more not so much to measure but more to um, check uh, for uh, offset so we'll actually be pl placing that on one side of the coupling and then kind of measuring the other side so you'll see that um, we don't use torque wrenches to loosen bolts. So these are for our hold down bolts. We're gonna have a combination wrench. I grabbed a uh, adjustable wrench just in case. Um, Allen keys for um, the coupling uh, bolts if we need to, to move the coupling. Uh, this is a tool that is um, an inspection mirror. This is designed to when the dial indicator that we're gonna mount on the coupling goes to the six o'clock position, we can measure or we can read the dial without having to, um, you know, contort our neck and, and reach around and look. Uh, I have a micrometer here. Uh, the reason I grabbed a micrometer is that um, we need to measure all of the shims. Let me grab it. All of these shims uh, have a number stamped on it. This one, as you can see, is 100 thou, but um, you have to kind of look at how these shims are made. Okay, so this, you can see that this is made out of 100 thou stock and it's stamped. So this is this was made from a big, huge sheet of steel. This is made from kind of a thinner stock that's been rolled out kind of more accurately. So this one has been precision ground. You can see the surface on it. It's a little bit more accurate. But these ones haven't been precision ground. This is just a sheet of metal that has been stamped out. So what I'm getting at is uh, you need a micrometer to measure out and check the thickness of our shims. So this one says it's four. And on my micrometer, I've got about four and a half. Okay, so the my point being that if you stack a multiple four thou shims on top of each other, you can compound a error in your shimming. So you want to always make sure that you have um, miked all your shims that you're going to place under. So this one says that it's 100 thou. And when I mic it, it is 100 thou shim it's actually reading uh, 96 so uh, the larger the thicker the shim the larger the error that they could potentially have so that's something to keep an eye on um, you want to make sure that the error between feet is not more than two thou otherwise you're inducing soft foot into the electric motor which is something that we're going to talk about a little bit uh, in the future uh, then I have a, uh, a level uh, with a square um, just in case um, we have a Starrett dial set here. So this Starrett dial set is um, has a mounting bracket that was a custom made uh, mounting bracket. And I'll show you how to install this in a little bit. I already kind of pre-installed it and, and took it off so that I could uh, show you in this video. But this Starrett dial kit is a, a button dial, we call it button dial. And instead of um, having the plunger come like this one where it's coming in at you know perpendicular to the center of the of the dial face these ones have the button coming off the back okay these button dials have adjustable or, or changeable plungers so right now I've got this kind of button on the back 
but you can swap those out and thread on all kinds of different sizes of attachments for it. One other piece that goes with these button dials is something called a wiggler. Okay, so the wiggler is a, uh, like a, like a teeter-totter. It's this, this dimension is the same as this dimension. So if we mount our wiggler in a close gap where we can't quite fit the dial in there, you can put the wiggler in between two, two narrow spaces and then mount your dial on this top part. So if the, if the wiggler changes position by that much, at the top, the plunger is going to be depressed that much. Okay, so that's a wiggler. Um, and then the last part that we have here is I've got um, a pack of shims. So these are two by two slotted shims. And you can see here it says it's size A. So there's A, B, C, and D size shims. So a D size or A size shim is two inches by two inches, and then there's a tab on it. Now, if it was a B, it would be three inches by three inches. C, four inches by four inches, and then Ds are nice, big, large, uh, five by five inch shims. Okay, so those are all the tools. Oh, and the last one is uh, our pry bar. Okay, so there's no hammering on any of this. This is just a, a standard uh, pry bar, heel bar that we're going to, not a heel bar, it's a pry bar. And we're going to use that for lifting up on the electric motor. If you have uh, a larger electric motors, then you have to use things like hydraulic rams or, or, um, uh, some kind of rigging or chain fall. But for this smaller stuff, we're just going to do it with, uh, with this bar here. And that's all the tools that we're going to use for our rim and face alignment. Okay, so now we have our tools. What we need to determine now is, um, you know, we have a work order to align this motor to this pump. Um, and, and this is something that you do for every alignment, whether it's doing a rim and face or a laser or a reverse dial or whatever the method is that you're gonna be aligning these. Uh, we have to determine whether or not any work needs to, be, needs to happen to these or we also need to make sure that um, these are worth aligning. So um, an example of, is it worth aligning? If this bearing in this pump is, is toast, um, there's no point in going through all the work of aligning these uh, together if we turn it on and then you realize that, that the, the bearing's gone, right? So we're gonna just do some quick preliminary checks to make sure that um, that this job is worth doing. It, can, it takes a few seconds and it, um, it can save you a lot of headache, <clears throat> headache in the future. So one of the checks that we do is called a lift check. Okay, so a lift check is just like it sounds. We're going to grab some blocks, okay, and we're gonna just lift up on the coupling and we're going to look for deflection okay so i can see that there's a couple thou i can almost get three out of it i'm not cranking on this really i'm just trying to lift the weight of this shaft it's not a large shaft and i can see that i got three thou out of it which is actually borderline what i would look at to have it replaced now this is an old pump um, so it's not, um, not, this isn't in, in real life, but I would say for 3000, that that would be something that I would look at as, as potentially being replaced. I would want to change this bearing out. Um, I usually look for a maximum of two, um, and you can cross reference the actual, um, tolerances for the bearings that it should actually have inside of it, um, after a rebuild and then kind of compare for this one here. I'm going to swap this guy over. So I'm just putting the dial indicator on the 12 o'clock position. And for the electric motor, um, it's a little bit different for this because um, the electric motor, I don't actually have the hold down bolts tightened down, but I'll just tighten this one just snug so that it, the feet of the motor don't lift on me. And this electric motor, 
I can get a lot. Okay, so that's going to be an issue for while I'm doing the alignment um, that I'm getting quite a bit of lift out of it. Now, it could also just be that I'm on a stand and that the whole table is flexing why I'm getting all of that. But um, yeah, so that would be, you know, a cause for concern that I'm getting that much deflection while I'm lifting. That's telling me that there's something going on inside of the bearings or that the base or something um, that's supposed to hold it down is, is not uh, not working. Again, you're always looking for about two thou. Okay. Next thing we're going to look for is um, we're going to look for uh, coupling issues or shaft issues. So for the coupling for uh, the outside uh, rim and then also the face, we're going to look for run out, either eccentric run out, which is off center run out. So something that would cause that would be if the hole in the coupling was bored too large. And then when we crank down on the set screw, it's going to pull the coupling off center. Okay. So that's going to cause an imbalance. No matter how much we align the two shafts, if there's an eccentric offset on the coupling, it's going to create an imbalance and it's going to wear out the machine faster. So that's something that we can identify right now before we do the alignment. Um, if we need to replace the coupling, we need to get a machinist um, to, to rebore a new one or, or something extra that we need to do there. The other one is just if this coupling here is, is angled. Okay. So there's a face run out. So we'll check the face and that's going to be really important also because we're going to be doing a rim and face alignment. So we're going to be mounting our dial indicators on this shaft here and going off of the face and the outside of this coupling. So if this coupling is skewed and so the face of it is on an angle, when we do our rim measurement and we shim our motor, we're aligning to the face of that motor or the face of that coupling, not necessarily to the axis of that shaft. So that's something that we need to, to identify and look at. And it's actually quite critical for what we're doing. And again, two thou is the magic number there. Okay. Um, next that we're going to look at. Uh, so yeah, well, to check that, what, what you would do is mount your dial indicator at the 12 o'clock position. Make sure that it goes back to your zero. And then you're going to put it on somewhere that you can get a full rotation all the way around. So for this coupling I'm seeing so I'm going to move it all the way to the maximum in one direction and then I'll here I'll start over on this one Okay, so I'll zero the dial, if you want. Okay, and start turning the pump. And you can see that at the maximum, I'm actually getting about a 5 thou change. And then it's coming back to zero. Okay, so it's not a coincidence that the zero is where this set screw is. And then when I come around to the opposite side of the set screw over here, that's where my maximum displacement is. So that's telling me that this bore is too large and that this coupling is, is out, okay? That would be something that we would wanna address. Five thou is too much for that. Um, we would want to have a, um, if we're doing a rim and face alignment, we would wanna have again within about two thou of eccentric run out on that. Um, we're not going to do that today. We're just going to assume that this is straight. Uh, this is just uh, for demonstration what we're going to be, what we're measuring. The next one that we're going to measure is actually, um, we're going to measure the face. Okay, so <clears throat> the, if we move this out here now. We're going to measure this face run out. And to do that, I'm going to mount a dial. Now, I'm not mounting it perfectly straight. 
but it is on the face. Okay, so I have a little bit of a cosine error here because I'm not going dead straight. I could grab the button dials, but this is just kind of a check to see how out of uh, round or how much angular run out it has. And so, so I'll move the dial all the way to one position. Okay, and then I'll zero it at that spot. Okay. And then I'm going to check this. Now there's rough edges. People have it on this. It looks like there's some paint that's chipped off. But really what I'm looking for is for the face to stay within my tooth thou range. And for that face measurement, it's looking quite good. You see it bouncing around a little bit from some of the surface roughness, but for the most part, it's staying staying in, this, in the center, which is good because we're going to go off of this front uh, face while we're doing our rim and face measurement. So I would do the same check on the um, coupling here and here. Now, one last thing that I want to do is that if I can, if I find run out, eccentric run out on this coupling, it might not be the coupling. It might be the shaft. If the shaft is bent, it's going to show up as a run out on the, on the coupling. So if I find it there, the next step I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick measurement on the shaft just to double check that the shaft isn't bent, and then I'm going to move on. Okay, so face, face, rim, run out, eccentric and angular, both within two thou. If I find it on the rim, I'm gonna check the shaft and I'm gonna check that two thou. That's gonna tell me that the rotating part of this assembly is good to, to do an alignment on. Okay, the last, some of the last checks that we're gonna do on this uh, pump and motor assembly is the, uh, the base, uh, the hold down bolts, the base, uh, and the feet of the motor. Okay, so these are some of the last things we're gonna check. So for the base, this is just on a, on a rolling table here that we've got sort of <laughs> jumping around off camera, but this, this part here um, is not, you know, an anchored uh, concrete base like you would see, but if it was, you would look for cracks in the concrete, you'd look for the hold down bolts, look for, there's a weld here, look for any kind of breaks or cracking, uh, anything that looks out of place. Uh, on the pump, you'd come in and you'd do a test and check, see that the bolts, you know, with a wrench, everything is held properly. Now for the, um, for the motor itself, um, there's a couple things that we want to look at. Uh, the first one is just to pull the uh, bolts out and just make sure that it's, the bolts are good. It's always a good idea to, to lift the bolts right out of position, uh, right out of the threaded hole. Um, and make sure that they're in a good condition. Now, I went yesterday and I uh, grabbed some new ones out of the tool crib. I also grabbed some new washers just to double check and make sure that uh, what we have for a hold down is good. Um, if you have the opportunity to move the motor out, you'd want to look at um, the threads and make sure that they were in good condition and chase them if you need to. Um, so I have uh, the bolts here and I actually replaced the bolts with these washers. Now, when you're doing an alignment, because the motor needs to move side to side, uh, the holes on the electric motor are larger than the hold down bolts that are required to give you that horizontal move. And it's very common to see a standard washers used in this application. But when we're doing alignments on these motors, we want to use hardened washers on it so that you don't end up with this kind of effect. And this, this, these washers were used here and they were tightened down multiple times and they're dished. And what happens is every time you tighten that down, because it's dished, the um, washer is flexing and it's creating a different amount of clamping pressure on the feet here. So we don't want that. We want nice, good, strong, straight um, washers on here that are hardened that aren't going to flex. The last thing that you want to do, um, if you, especially if you haven't um, pulled the motor out, is take all the bolts out and lift the motor up and check to see that there aren't any shims stuck to it and that there's no dirt or grit or anything that's 
underneath the feet. You got to think of any kind of dirt or grit that gets in there is just like a shim itself, right? We just don't know it's there. So um, doing a quick, grab a scraper, do a quick clean of everything. I did this all yesterday, but you want to make sure that the feet and the contact surfaces, when we put our shims in there, everything is perfectly clean so that we're not inducing any soft foot while we do our shim adjustments. Okay, so that's the, the motor and feet and base. Okay, so the last uh, check that we want to do um, before we start getting into the alignment phase of this is um, something called pipe strain. So depending on what standards, if you're working to ISO or API standards or what, however the, the facility you're working at operates, the um, piping that comes into this in suction side and on this discharge can actually flex and create issues for your alignment. You can do a great job of aligning this work here, but the pipes are giving a twist or strain to the, um, to the whole structure. So to, to check for pipe strain, what you would do is um, mount a dial indicator to the top of, of the, this pump, and then you would loosen off all the bolts and look to see if the um, pump changes in any way. Okay, that's going to tell you that you have pipe strain or not. Um, some places will ask you to do like a, like a, like a dry test with the pipe strain where you um, just unbolt and rebolt it and look for any movement. And then they'll actually fill the pipes up with water to see if the weight of the water affects how the, the pipe with the pipe being supported affects the you know structure and, and how the pipe pump is being um, distorted with the volute. Um, so that's one last thing. That's not something that you do necessarily every single time. If the volute hasn't moved, if the piping hasn't moved, if you've gone through that, that's not necessarily something that you would do if you're in a breakdown situation and start doing a, a pump or a, a pipe strain test. But um, if it is a shutdown or you do have the time to do it, undoing these bolts and um, not a bad idea to just change the gasket while you've got it there and, and um, and just check for that uh, that pipe strain. Okay, so slight change of pl uh, plans here. We, uh, as you can see, we swapped out for a different pump because we needed the um, rigidity of this base plate. This guy here, when we started uh, mucking around and correcting the soft foot, um, we found that we had uh, a loose soft foot on this front. Okay, so I look at this, this front, and then when we come around to this side, uh, this back was also quite loose. Um, so this one was loose too. So we're going to swap over to an actual proper base on this table. Uh, now it's not grouted in and we're hoping that's good, but this one was too thin and I think that this base is, is flexing. When I was tightening bolts down, I was, I was uh, detecting that the uh, base was, was flexing. This one is a giant cast sole plate. Even though it's not grouted and anchored into the ground, it should give us a nice strong foundation. So Ben is checking all of the checks that we just did. He's looking for run out right now. And then once we make sure that this is all good, we'll jump into the next steps. Looks like you're already pretty much zeroed. Just make sure that your plunger doesn't end up in that uh, bolt hole when you turn it. Okay, we're ready to get going here. Uh, so what Ben is going to look for is he's going to do the really rough alignment. He's going to uh, look for how much we need to bring that motor up without before we've tightened down any bolts or anything. And he's going to kind of get an idea and say, okay, this is about one eighth of an inch. This is 125 thou shim he's got, and it just lightly drags underneath the the scale. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add uh, 125 under all four of these feet.
Okay, so what we've done now is we've added this 125 under all four feet. And now what we have to do is we have to look for obvious soft wood. So you can see that this one here is sitting nice and sturdy on the on the leg. This one out back here, this one here is obviously soft foot. It's loose. This one here is down and snug. And then over here, this one is down and snug. So what we have here is on this front left foot, we have something called obvious soft foot. So now what we have to do is we have to figure out what this gap is here and we have to correct it by adding that shim. And what we're effectively doing now is we're um, taking our, our restaurant, like, like the, the, the weight is not evenly distributed between all four of these feet. So this is our soft foot. It's just like when you're at a restaurant and you sit down and the table rocks. If we were to start doing an alignment before we corrected this, every time we tighten these bolts down, the table or the motor is going to orientate in a slightly different position and it's going to make it impossible for us to do an alignment. So by figuring out what this gap is and then going through and doing a few more steps, we can eliminate all of this soft foot. The other thing that we did is we brought the coupling up to elevation now so that the moves that we're making are much smaller than if we had just started out by using feeler gauges with without putting this shim in here. The reason why that's important is every time we go to do these these moves, the smaller the increment of shim change that we do, the more accurate and easier the move is going to turn out. Okay, so uh, really rough alignment. Now we got to figure out what this is, correct it, and then we're going to torque down all the bolts. Three thou. Three? Okay. So, yeah, let's throw a three thou in there and there. Let's see if it works. Seems like four on the inside, but three on the end. So, yeah, no, it's not touching. Not touching. Okay, so Ben just measured it up uh, as three thou of obvious soft foot. And now he can show us that that three thou and that foot drags a little bit. So when he pulls on that, he can probably yard it out of there if he really wanted to. But right now it's touching. So we want to correct the soft foot to within, final soft foot within two thou. So he's got that in there. Now all, we'll go around and check all of the feet all still hold. Um, they all still hold a, uh, a bit of a friction under there. So now our next step is to torque down the bolts. So when we go to torque down these bolts, what we want to do is we want to do it in a pattern that's the same every time. And we're going to come down and we're going to, first we're going to snug up all four bolts. Then we're going to torque them to 50%. Then we're going to torque them to our final torque value. And what, and that's going to, um, we're going to do that every time we do a, an adjustment on this motor. First, we'll just use the wrench and we'll just snug it up. Uh, you know, just, just so it's. So when we're snugging up the first first step here, snug is different to me 
Ben Ben is a big strong guy. He's he's obviously going to be able to pull on this wrench a lot harder than I am. So it's kind of different for both of us. So when I'm snugging up the first step, I'm going to just do it myself. I'm not going to pass the wrench over to Ben. I'm just going to do it so that way I know it's roughly the same amount of force evenly applied. Okay, now we're gonna torque the first uh, round. Uh, this, this, uh, I don't think that big one will fit in. Uh, I, I'll grab a wrench. Okay, so the first step that we're gonna do, we're gonna we're gonna uh, tighten this first front right, then we're gonna tighten the back left, then we're gonna come here. So we're gonna do a cross pattern and we're gonna do it to 50% the torque value. So I have this little torque wrench, I've got it set to 50% and I'm going to get a socket on here and then I'm gonna, doesn't really fit. Torque that one to 50%. So now I've torqued them to 50%. Now what I would normally do is I'd torque it to the full 100%, but um, because we are um, you know, working on this demonstration uh, pump, I don't wanna actually do that just because if I torque these to 100%, over time I'm gonna wear away at the threads that are inside of this base. And this has to be torqued and retorqued multiple times and I don't wanna put Healy coils or have to start repairing the threads. So I'm just gonna stick with a 50% torque value just for this exercise. Okay, so now that I've got these all tightened down, we remove the obvious soft foot, we torque the feet, okay, 50%, then we theoretically tighten them all to 100%. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen off each one of these feet and I'm gonna check each one of them individually for my final soft foot check with a feeler gauge. And I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna look in the front, I'm gonna look in the each corner, I'm gonna come in with my feeler gauge all around, I'm gonna look to see if there's any angular or offset soft foot here, okay? And, and then once I'm done, I'm not gonna loosen off any other feet, I'm gonna torque this one right back down to the full 100% torque value, and then I'm gonna move on to the next one and I'm gonna look for them, correcting them as I go. So I'm not gonna use a torque wrench to loosen this off. Just use a proper wrench. And then I wanna keep my soft foot to within two thou. So I'm gonna grab my two thou feeler gauge. And looking at this, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna check and say, okay, so it's a little bit, seems right off the bat, a little bit soft in the front here. And it seems like it's touching on the, on that part there. So let's see. Okay. No, it's touching on that part. So it's in the front corner here. It, it doesn't really bite, but as I move the feeler gauge in, I can feel that it seems like this foot is angled a little bit. So I'm gonna just step up my feeler gauge a little bit and look for how big this gap actually is and then make a judgment of whether or not I wanna take it on and fix it or not, okay? So three really drags, okay? At four, barely, I can't slide a four around at all. I can feel, that, yeah, the four doesn't really go anywhere. So I wonder if there's a little bit of damage maybe to the foot. I, I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but the four doesn't go in anywhere. The three goes in on the front, but I can't push it in at all. So I'm gonna say that that one's good. I'm gonna grab my torque wrench and I'm gonna tighten this down. 
Okay, so that's torqued down. Now I'm gonna work around. I'm gonna do that to all four feet. Okay, so we're getting ready to do the alignment here and we have our brackets now set up nicely. We have um, a rim and face set up. So you can see we got this one here is on the rim and then we have the second gauge here, that one's on the face. And we're gonna use these two dials and rotate them relative to this pump to calculate what we need to do for our shim changes. And that's essentially what we're gonna do for the rim and face. But before we get into doing those measurements, I just wanna talk about a few concepts of the dials. Um, the first one is called bar sag. So what bar sag is, if I take this, this is just a mock-up on a mandrel. So this is just a, a dial indicator bracket. And you can see that when I, if I zero this out, okay, check that it works, okay, that it's got a zero, it's zeroed. But if I flip it around upside down, you can see that it is um, minus nine. You can see that it's minus nine. Okay, so if I come this way, I didn't go back to zero. That's a problem. So that tells me that there's some kind of looseness in my setup here that I'd want to uh, get fixed. But if I have this here and then I rotate it down to the bottom, Okay, if I zero this out like this, and then I rotate it down to zero, okay, and I'll just show you like here, you can see that I got a negative eight uh, on the dial. And what that is, is this whole uh, bar setup has gravity of, of working on it. So when it's at the top, it's got gravity pushing down one direction. So it's actually angled down this way. And so when I come back this way, it's got a a negative eight so it's pushing down the opposite way and th that's important because we need to know what that number is because when we take this vertical measurement here and we take this measurement here we have gravity pushing down on our setup and when we come around to the other side here to here now the gravity is pushing down and that's called bar sag and we need to know what that is now if you have a really good skookum set of uh, uh, mounts or, or um, brackets for your for your dial indicators, there is no bar sag. You don't have to worry about it. If you're doing lasers, you don't have to worry about it because they're just bouncing for up, up sideways. If you're doing horizontal measurements, you don't have to worry about it because the plunger is moving this way. It's only these vertical readings that we're gonna do from the top and from the bottom that the bar sag really affects it. Now I can't calculate the bar sag off of here. I have to actually take this off and I have to find a similar, now that I know the distance where I'm gonna mount it, I actually have to mount this on a mandrel or something different with a standoff that's the same distance apart here. And then I actually have to rotate it and figure out what my bar sag is on this indicator setup. Then I take that number and I actually add it to, um, add it to the, what it should be at the bottom. Another way of calculating bar sag that's kind of neat though, is something called the validity rule. And so if I zero my um, indicator at 12 o'clock here, and then I come around to, you might go around the other side there. No, just you, yeah, just to tell me. And I go to this side, what, is the, what does this one say? Uh, from come. zero, it's, about 82. Okay, so 18. And if I come across this way, it's 83. So this plus this, 3 plus 9 is equal to 0 plus 12. Okay, so I'll say that again, and I'll actually draw that on the board. Go to our, to our whiteboard. When we're doing these rim readings, and we have, we're looking at our 12 o'clock, 
and our six o'clock, if we zero our 12 o'clock out and we look at our three o'clock and you said that it was negative 18 or 82 on our 100, 100 dial, and then this side over here is minus 17, this plus this will equal what this six o'clock position is. So in this case, it would be, oh gosh, math, uh, 35. Okay, so if I go from here to the bottom and it doesn't say minus 35 and it says something like minus 42, then I know that my um, bar sag is uh, seven or it's, it's taking seven thou away from it. Okay, so that's called the validity rule and it's a way of checking to see if your dials are actually um, working. So um, I'll zero again. And I'll double check my readings. And Ben, if you want to go on the other side there. Again for me, thank you. It's about 83 again. Okay, so we'll say minus 17. And then it goes back to zero. And then they come here and it's at 83 again. So that's also at minus 17. And I'm at the exact same position. So if I come to the bottom here, can you grab the mirror? If we come to the bottom here, it is negative 10, 20, 32. So that's telling me that we don't have any bar sag. We have, so we had zero, we had minus 17 and minus 17. And then at the bottom, we, it looked like it was saying minus 32. So it's actually um, should be minus 34. So this tells me that there isn't any bar sag. If this was a higher, negative number that would tell me that there was um, bar sag so we want to make sure that our bar sag is within um, within two thousand or two mil that's another thing you're going to maybe see mil written in there a lot um, mil is just another way of saying a thousand like you know like a millennium every thousand years there's a millennium so a mil is another way of saying instead of saying two thousandths of an inch right you say two thou but you can also just say it's two mil Right, so you say, pass me a, a 10 mil shim. It's a 10 thousandths of an inch shim. And so that's some of the terminology that you might, you might see. So I'm happy with our gauge setup and we're gonna start working through uh, taking readings and, uh, and calculating some of our shims. Okay, so I wanna measure my, for, to do the angular measurement, I have to measure the face. When I do the outside rim, that's where I'm, calcu that's where I'm measuring the offset. So for this, what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm in the exact same spot every time. So if I take my level here and I go through the center line and I try and pick out exactly where I'm, what I want to be each time and just draw a line on here, it just helps me just make sure that when I take my measurements, I'm always taking my measurements in the right direction. And this pump is not moving. That's the big advantage of rim and face alignment over other alignments is that other alignments you have to move the two together this one you don't have to sometimes this is a maybe a gearbox or something coupled um, that can't turn and can't move and that's the big advantage of of this rim and face so if i come back up to the 12 o'clock position and i'm making sure that my button is right spot on where i want it to be and then i zero at that location now i'm going to very slowly come down watching the dial in which way it's going to go. And at the 12 o'clock position, I have a dis difference of, I'm going to just double check with the mirror here to make sure that I'm spot on exactly where I want to be. So I have negative five. Now to make sure that my reading is still accurate, I'm actually going to continue back up go to the top and make sure that my reading is back to zero and it is you can see it comes right back to zero now i'm going to go again i'm not just going to say okay i did it once you guys know this old saying like measure twice cut once we'll measure twice shim once and this comes around to the bottom and again i'm going to read it and again i got minus five so it's at the 95 mark so it went negative so now we'll go back over to our whiteboard here 
if I grab my ruler and I'm right on the edge of this coupling, so if I measure the diameter of this coupling, this coupling is four and one quarter inch diameter, okay? So the diameter that I'm measuring on the face is four and one quarter inches or 4.25, okay? Okay, so when I zeroed it at the top and then I did the sweep reading to the six o'clock position, I got, a, uh, I got five mil, negative five mil, which tells me that there's a five degree gap in, which tells me that the back end of this motor is high or the front here is low, okay? So what I need to do now is I need to find out for every, um, the, the diameter of my coupling here is, uh, or the di not the diameter of the coupling, the diameter that I actually measured in is gonna be 4.25 inches, okay? And that 4.25 inches, as I swept, sweep around, it gets five thou or five mil of, of change. So that, I need to find out for every thou or every inch of change, I need to find out what kind of change I get. So if I go five divided by my 4.25, what I get is 1.176 thou per inch. Okay, for every inch of change downwards, I get that much difference. So why do I need to know that? Well, if this is high in the back, that's telling me that the motor feet, if the ground is flat, it's telling me that the motor feet are angled down this way. Okay, and the reason they're angled down that way is because our, we just measured it and our coupling came up and it's a little bit offset from that. Okay, so if I drew from here, and then this is a right angle. So the face of our coupling is at a right angle to the feet of our motor. And so as I tilt that forward, and that's what we found when we, when we measured it, is that we have, it, it's a little bit bigger at the bottom. So when I measure that, if I was to go back and measure the distance between this foot and this foot, and so let's say it's like 10, 10 inches, I don't know what it is yet, we'll figure that out. I know for every thou, every inch of travel that I get, I have a, um, change of 0.176. So if that was the case, I would have to come back on, on the back foot 11.76 mil or thou, right? I'd just be moving that decimal if it was 10, 10 inches. So for every inch of change from the front to the back foot, this change gets a little bit larger here. So I calculate the change per inch off the coupling, and then I look at the distance between the front and the back foot and then I multiply by that, okay? And that's how I'm gonna calculate how much I need to take out the back in order to get the proper offset. Now, I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna say, okay, you know what though? I have 125 thou in the front and 125 thou in the back. Um, it'd probably be easier instead of pulling that out and putting a huge stack of shims in to, for the beginning, it might just be easier just to lift up the front. So if that, or sorry, drop the front. Sorry. Yeah, lift up the front because I'm low in the front, I'm high in the back. So I'm gonna just adjust and add shims to the front and then bring the whole thing up, up in um, offset there so that there's no angular. Um. Okay, so I was joking when I said 10 inches on the feet. I just pulled a number out, nice round number. So the number that I actually found is that the, the bolt front to back is 10. So what that's saying, what that's telling me is I have a larger gap at the bottom, which means that the motor is high in the back and I have um, 1.17 thou per inch every 10 inch, which tells me I'm high like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add 11, 12 mit thou in the front and that should take out all of my angular offset. So to change the shim change, it seems kind of counterproductive and it seems like a little bit of extra work, but what I'm actually gonna do is I'm actually gonna loosen up all four of the bolts. This motor should be sitting nice on the floor, no soft foot, no distortion. So when I tighten, loosen this off, if the shims are in good condition, there's no dirt, nothing should really move. So I'm gonna do that and I'm, I'm gonna loosen, completely loosen off the bolt so I can freely lift this pump. I don't wanna keep the back ones tight and then try and jam a shim underneath it. I want the whole thing to be loose. I want to lift it up gently with a pry bar, put in my 12th thou in the front, and then drop it that back down. There's no dirt, everything's clean. And then I'm going to tighten these bolts back up. 
So again, we're loosening off with our wrench, not our torque wrench. And I got my horizontal jacking screws are, are loose here. Okay, so nothing should change, nothing, nothing should move at this point. Okay, so Ben's on the other side there, and I'm here, and he's just handed me a 10 thou and a 2 thou. And what we're going to do is we're going to slide these in the front nicely in line. Now we have a 125 thou shim here, and we've got a 10 and a 2 here. So I'm going to put the 2 in the middle. I'm actually going to slide it in. I'm not going to put the 2 on the top. I'm going to sandwich it in the middle here and slide it in right there. And um, just one sec, and when we get it in there, the other thing I wanna do quickly is I wanna grab the micrometer and I wanna actually mic my shims and make sure that the ones that I'm putting in. Now these are gonna be much more accurate because these are small enough that they've actually been uh, ground. So they should be what they say they're going to be, but it's always a good thing to check. Yeah, that one's 10. And this one here should be two. And it is, okay? You wanna make yours. And I'll go ahead and I'll slide these ones in on my side. You don't have to do them at the same time. And I'm just coming up a little bit here. Okay. And I'm sliding these shims in nice and straight, all in line, um, so that uh, it sits down nice and nice and firmly. It's there. You can see there's no soft foot. It's holding on there really nicely. And then yeah, you gotta, you gotta... So sometimes you have to pull the large one out just to kind of get them all in there together. Otherwise it can get a little. good okay and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna tighten this down in the same way that we tightened it down before we're gonna do this front right foot and then the back left and then this back foot and then that one the exact same way so that we know everything's gonna go first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna snug these bolts up okay to my snug not pass the wrench off the bend because he's a much stronger guy than I am and then we're gonna Come back with our torque wrench and we're going to do a 50% torque and then we're going to do our 100% torque. So I can pass the torque wrench to you then. Click. So that's our 50% torque. And as you remember, we're just doing our 50% torque for this because I don't want to wear out the base and strip the bolts too much. Okay, so that's the back right. That's the back right, bend in the back left, and that will be the front back. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll bring our face dial back up to the 12 o'clock position, and we'll zero it. And I'll just check it that it's coming to zero. And then when we go back down to the 12 o'clock or the six o'clock position, we should see the dial go to zero. And boom, spot on zero. Just for proof. I don't think you're get up in there. I don't know what's in there. <laughs> okay, zero. So you can see I'm directly on the line that I scribed. And the dial reads zero. And then I come back up to the top here. Okay. And then that reads zero also. Exactly on zero. Okay. So now what we have to do is we have to, we've done our horizontal or our angular. We did our va. Now we need to do the vo. Okay, so to do the vo, we, we measure the angular off the front because we're measuring how much angular offset we are. Now we're going to be measuring 
how much offset there is. So to calculate the offset, we need to go by the dial on the outside edge here, okay? So it's a bit of, uh, same process, but there's an extra step here, which is when I zero this, and then I go to the six o'clock position, whatever it tells me, I have to divide it in two because it's actually measuring the offset twice. You have to have, have offset measurements, okay? You have to cut them in half. So again, I've got my line still exactly where it is. I'm gonna just double check my, um, my offset. And I'm gonna come down nice and gently to the six o'clock position. And then I'm going to read my dial. I should have followed it as it came down. Okay, so that's my 12 o'clock, it's zeroed. So it's going negative and now it's going positive. Positive, 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 positive. Okay, and it's positive. 35. Okay, so if we go back over to the whiteboard, we have to discuss what we just measured. What we just did there is we had our two couplings. And I came across from the shaft here, and I measured on here and I zeroed it. And then I came across to the bottom and I was on the bottom and I, and I was measuring, I ended up with a reading of, what was it, minus? 35. Positive 35, wasn't it? Plus 35. So again, we have to stop. We have to figure out what it is that we're telling. So if we have an offset condition, okay, where we have our, and we're looking from the end now, so these are our two coupling halves, this distance right here is how off much offset we've got. But if we zeroed at the 12 o'clock position and we go all the way to the bottom, we're actually measuring this offset here and we're also measuring this offset. That's why we have to have the, the rim readings. So if we zeroed at the top and we came down to 35, what it's telling us is that the plunger has been depressed 35 thou, which tells me that the motor is high because when we came in and we looked at it, if we zeroed it, we zero it here and then we bring it around to the bottom. If the plunger is, is pushed, the plunger which is mounted on my um, motor has been depressed, okay? It means that the plunger has gone in, which means that this now this distance is the same, right? But if the plunger is in, that's telling me that the pump is lower than the motor or the motor is high, okay? And it's high by 17 thou or, or mils or 17.5, okay? Which is half of my 35. So what I have to do now is I need to go in. We have 125 in the back and we have 137 in the front because we just added 12 here. So now what we need to do is we need to take away 17.25 uh, here. So we need to take this one minus 17.5 or 18. And if you round to the nearest thou, it's not going to do anything bad. And we need to take our 137 and we need to subtract 17.5. Uh, now you're saying like, well, why didn't we just um, do the, the va and the vo at the same time? Why did we do it two different steps? You can if you want to, but I, it doesn't really take a lot of time once you get set up. So I just like to do the angular and then I go through and then I'll do the offset. And what I find it does is it gives you the ability to just kind of stay in control and just watch how the shim movements and everything is kind of changing. So now I need to come down and I need to do some math in my head here. Um, so this is going to be um, 107.5. Uh, and this one is going to be 119.5. Okay, so we're going to try to shoot for those shim packs. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to loosen off all four feet completely. We're going to pull out the shims and we're going to change them out from 125 to 108 or 107, depending on what we've got for shims. And then we're going to put those in the back. 
And then we're going to do the same thing in the front. We're going to have our 119 and a half, and we're going to pull out what we just put in there, and we're going to just make up an entirely new shin pack that's going to equal 120 in the front. And then our angular and our offset should both be spot on for our, um, our va and our vo. Okay, we just... okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to loosen off and we're going to do this last movement here. So I'm going to loosen these bolts completely off, not take them out or anything. do first um, is we'll just do it one at a time uh, we'll just take out one at a time because I don't want to just drop the whole front of the motor and everything just, you could but I would rather just do it one at a time so if I take out the one the motor should still balance on the three right it's not gonna like fall forward uh, or anything like that so I'm just gonna take these guys out and I'm gonna pass this to Ben to put these back and um, what I need is 120 thou so um, this was 112, or I don't know exactly what that was. Um, so we're going to take these ones and then I need, um, basically to mic this and mm -hmm. then give me, um, should be one, should work out to 120. Just double check when you mic it though, that, um, it actually equals 137. Thirty-seven. We pulled out. We need to put in one twenty. We're basically taking out uh, eighteen. Yeah, you can here again. So this is one twenty-nine. So this is a great opportunity. This is a good teaching moment here. So these shims that we put in, it was a 125 shim that we put in there at the beginning when we were eliminating the soft foot, but it's actually, it's kind of labeled here as 112. So this shim is actually a little bit thin, okay? So this is, it's saying that it's one, well, this mic says it's 117, okay? So when we pulled this out before we made our shim change, I said to Ben, yeah. quickly take a mic and let's just mic this and just double check that it is the 137 that we thought it was, okay? So if we add up the numbers that are on these shims, it's 137, but if we measure this out with our micrometer, we find out that this is actually um, 129. So we need to subtract, um, our dials don't lie, so we need to subtract uh, 18 from 129, which is 111. So we need to actually take this out and put in 111. So that's why it's always really good to mic your shims when you're um, putting them in or, or doing anything. But um, yeah, this is just based off of our, our rough alignment that we did. So you have 111 there? Or... Okay. Okay, so again, I got my, my super thin one thou, we got a 10 and we got a 100. And we're gonna mic this and just double check that this is 111, which is what we wanted. And it's 107. <laughs> so instead of this, this one thou here, maybe give me a five. Okay, so I got a five, a 10 and 100, and if I mic this, now I've got 111 and a half, okay? So that's good, I'm happy with that. 111 and a half, we're pretty darn close, so I'm gonna actually take this and I'm gonna put it in. So that's why it's important to keep an eye on your shims, mic them, make sure that you know um, what you're doing. That's where, if you've ever done an alignment before and then you make a shim change, especially with a laser, and then you go through and you, um, 
you know, you do another sweep after it and you try and figure out, well, it didn't do anything that I said it was supposed to do or it went way further than it was supposed to. Now it's saying take shims out. Now I just put shims in. Now it's telling me to take shims out. I don't know what's going on. It's because of that. It's really critical to make your shims as you go because they're not as accurate as you think that they would be. Okay. So same thing on Ben's side. You got, you got a bar there? Yep. Ben's going to take out his on the front and he's going to put in uh, his 111 based on uh, micrometer settings. Yeah, or he's gonna mic it and then see what it was and then subtract his his from his side. And I'm gonna take a second and put these shims away so we don't end up with a huge pile of shims. So I put in 111 on Ben's side, he has to do 115 because his initial uh, shim pack that he put in when we eliminated the soft foot was a little bit larger than mine. Because that was where the obvious soft foot was. So we added that extra shim and he had a different 125 thou shim in there. So he's got a little bit different shims on his side, but it doesn't matter as long as you're miking it and you're adjusting based on your micrometer readings. You're fine. Okay, so we did that in the front, now we have to do the same thing in the back. So I've got a 125 here. I'm gonna take that 125 out here, I'm miking it. It's actually telling me it's 117. So if I try to take 17, I basically need to put 100 thou back in here. Okay, so this is really great to, to just show. So we actually have a hundred and a five thou together actually reading uh, 100, just under 100. So the, the big thing about that is you have to make sure that you, you don't just go by what is stamped on these. This was 94 and this is a 5,000. So together they're, little, they're 99 basically or 100. Um, so if we had just taken the 100 out of the box and, sl and slid it in, we would have been creating an angular offset into our, um, into our pump. So, uh, or on our motor and pump assembly. So. Um, Ben's going to throw those in the back there and then um, go from there. Okay, so if we did this good, did this well. Um, we, we're going to check our offset now, and we should be uh, zero, let's see, zero on the top. Uh, we should be exactly zero when we go to the bottom. So it's a good sign because it's reading 17, or just about 20 when I go here. So I'm going to offset this guy, okay, right on my line. And then I'm going to come down, and it's going positive, 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 positive. And now it's going to go back the other way. Okay, negative, 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 negative. And Okay, so now it's reading negative two thou. So we're one thou off on our offset, which I think is good enough. <laughs> I don't think we need to adjust it one thou. 
uh, on offset. So when we look at our horizontal angular, again, we'll just check that. I'll zero it on the top, okay? And then we're gonna come down to the bottom. Okay, so that's zero, perfect. Okay, and then on the top, we're gonna zero it and we're really out horizontally, so you see the dial go crazy, but it comes back to our mark. And if I hold it on our mark, and I check it here, I've got, well, yeah, it's quite out horizontally, but yeah. And I got it at one degree, one, one thou, two thou. So we're, we're spot on exactly where we want to be vertically. Now we need to do the horizontal in the exact same steps, except for shimming. Instead of doing shimming, we're going to do it with these jacking bolts right here. Okay, so we're going to go through the same process. We're going to measure the face at our, at our uh, nine, uh, three o'clock or a nine o'clock position. And then we're going to come across to this side and we're going to find out how much it changes. And then from there, what we're going to do is we're going to adjust and we're going to move the motor with these jacking bolts side to side. We're going to loosen off all the bolts and we're going to move it side to side. Um, and we're going to track how much we're moving it um, by uh, using these screws to kind of push and, and adjust how we're going to how we're going to move it angularly and then and then try it. So it's a lot easier doing the horizontal moves because you can kind of do it in real time. Okay. Okay, so I zeroed it here, and then I'm coming across, it went positive 15, and I'm coming across, and I got positive 15. Okay, so I have 15 thou across the same four and a quarter um, inch coupling diameter that I'm measuring on. So 15 divided by 4.25, So three and a half thou per inch, okay? So we have 10, 10 inches between center, and we think about our plunger, our plunger went in on this side. So it's telling me that the back of the motor is actually pointed that way, because we started off at zero on this side, okay? And then when we come around to the other side, it's a positive number, which means that the plunger is getting pushed in. You can only get pushed in if the distance on this side is closer than it is on this side. Okay, if it's a larger distance on that, that's telling me that the motor is tilted out that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to loosen off all the bolts and then we're going to gently hold this set screw forward or up against the foot. And then we're going to go back on the back foot and we're going to push the motor over while we have a dial gauge on this side. And we're gonna hope that on, on this foot here, and we're gonna hope that, that it pivots it and changes it that in that direction. Okay, so I'm gonna just hold that one there, and then I'm going to loosen off all the bolts. Okay, so another way that we can do this too is instead of using a dial indicator, we can actually use a shim. So we need to come over, how many thou is it that we need to come over? Third, it was 3 points. 3 3.5, 3 3.25. It was 3.52. 3.52? Yeah. Okay, so we need to come over 35 thou. So one way to do that, where, where did our construction dial? So one way to measure that is just to, um, without touching anything, and you just loosen the bolts off so nothing's getting bumped here, uh, we can take our uh, dial indicator and Okay, so now I've got this one backed off and this one holding it. So if I push on this back, it should pivot on here and come into line. Now I'm going to zero my dial indicator that I've mounted here. 
Okay, and then I'm gonna just double check that it comes back to zero and everything's working good because I don't wanna lose this. Otherwise, I gotta take another reading. And if you look at it from the top down, you'll see that I have the dial indicator set up in line with the foot. I don't need to measure it here. I just need to measure it on that plane. I need to measure it in the plane with the bolt. I don't necessarily need to go in here and measure this. And then what I'll do is I'll come across to the side here and everything's loosened off, right? So all the hold down bolts are all loose. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I'm zeroing this guy and I'm gonna move it over to 32. 0.5. Okay, because it was 10 inch centers. So again, make sure that this guy's snug. And then I'm going to come across to 32.5 and stop. And then I'm going to back that screw off. I'm not going to hold this screw here. And I'm also going to loosen this one off here. Okay. So now. Bolting, bolting this down isn't gonna change our horizontal. So I don't need to bolt it down to do a final adjust check on my angular. So if I come to the this position here and I zero it and I sweep across to this side here, so I'm zeroing it in this location, okay? And now I'm gonna come across and I'm going to measure it on the opposite side, it should read zero. What does it read over there then? Zero. Right on zero, okay? So now we've done the ha, okay? Now we need to do the whole part. So we need to look at the offset side of it. So now we have to zero this guy. I'll zero it on my side, okay? So we have offset, okay? So I'm gonna zero it here, 